The Dead Woman is a scary ghost story about a man who lives next door to a haunted house. A few years ago, I rented a house in the countryside. My neighbors were a married couple named Lisa and Michael. They had two young children, a boy and a girl. They were a nice, quiet family and pretty much kept to themselves. One night, I was awakened by a blood-curdling scream. It sounded like it was coming from the house next door. I jumped out of bed, threw on my dressing gown and ran downstairs. When I got to my front gate, two small figures came flying at me and almost knocked me off my feet. I realized it was the kids who lived next door, but I was stunned by their appearance. The boy was in his pajamas and the girl was in her nightie. Their faces were deathly pale and they looked up at me with terror in their eyes. Both kids held on to me and began to cry. Their mother came rushing towards us and I could see she was terrified as well. What happened? I asked. I heard screams. There's someone in our house. Lisa gasped, her voice shaking with fear. I. I heard someone in the kitchen. I was too afraid to go check. Then I heard someone climbing the stairs and I heard the door to my children's bedroom opening. Then I heard my daughter screaming. It was terrible. I immediately got the kids and we ran out. Did you see who it was? I asked. No, she replied. The children ran out of the bedroom. I didn't dare to check it. Please help us. We need to call the police. I looked at the children, still trembling with fear. Where's their father? I asked. He's working the night shift, Lisa said. I told them to go into my house and call the police. She thanked me, took her children by the hand and ran to my house. I decided to check out their house. The front door was standing open. It was dark and silent. All of a sudden, I felt a cold chill run down my spine. I had the strangest feeling that someone was watching me. In the back of my mind, a little voice kept telling me, it's a trap. I don't know what came over me, but at that moment, I was very scared. Scared of the unknown. Scared of what might be lurking inside the darkened house. Pull yourself together, I muttered. You're not a child anymore. I started to walk up the garden path, but then I saw something that made me stop in my tracks. Click. In one of the upstairs windows, the light suddenly came on. The house was supposed to be empty. I looked up at the lighted window, but I didn't see anything, just curtains blowing in the breeze. There's something up there, the little voice in my head whispered. And it's not afraid of being found. In fact, it wants you to find it. I tried to tell myself I was just being silly. How stupid was it for an adult man to be afraid to go into a house because he is afraid of ghosts? If it's a thief, I thought to myself, then why would they switch on the lights? Click. The light turned off. What the hell? I thought and took a few steps back. I still did not see anything in the darkness, but I felt goosebumps rising on my skin. Click. The light turned on again. When I looked up at the window, my heart skipped a beat. There was a dark figure standing there. It was a woman. Her skin was taut and shriveled and her hair was long and unkempt. She looked like a corpse. She just stared down at me with her hollow, empty eye sockets and she smiled a dead smile. Click. The light went out. I turned and ran back to my own house. When I got to my front door, I banged on it until the neighbor lady let me in. She looked at me with a mixture of fear and anxiety. My face was pale and my eyes were so frightened that the children began to cry again. Water, I panted. I need water. Lisa grabbed a glass, filled it with water and handed it to me. I downed it in one gulp. My heart was pounding and I had broken into a cold sweat. I was afraid that I was having a heart attack. Did you call the police? I asked, trying to pull myself together. They're on their way, she said. Did you check the house? Um. Let's just wait for the police, I replied. 
A few minutes later, the police finally arrived. They searched the house from top to bottom, but they didn't find any thief. There was no one there at all. The police questioned the neighbors, but nobody had seen or heard anything. When they questioned me, I didn't tell them what I had seen. What could I tell them? That I had seen a dead woman in the window, smiling an unearthly smile? Nobody would believe me. The police eventually finished up their business and left to take care of more important things. Around 7 o'clock in the morning, the woman's husband came home. The children were glad to see him and together, the family returned to their house. I tried not to look at their house, especially at the upstairs window. After that crazy night, I began to have trouble sleeping. As soon as I closed my eyes, I would see the face of the dead woman. Then, life seemed to get back to normal. The neighbors gradually managed to forget all about the incident, no one screamed during the night and I didn't see any dead bodies standing in windows. Everything seemed to be back on track and life was good. But one evening, about a month later, I heard someone knocking on my front door. The knock was loud and strong. They kept banging and banging as if they were going to break my door down. I looked through the peephole and saw that it was the neighbor lady, Lisa. I opened the door and found her standing there, grinning at me. What happened? I asked. She didn't reply. She just smiled and walked straight past me. She went into my house and turned left, into the living room. She left me standing on the doorstep, dumbfounded. That fixed smile on her face unnerved me. It was so creepy, almost inhuman. It made me shiver from head to toe. It was dark outside and no birds were singing. I was about to follow her inside when I heard voices coming from the house next door. When I glanced over the fence, I saw the neighbor children playing in the front yard. Then, I froze. I could not believe what I was seeing. Lisa was there. She was standing there in her front yard, playing with the children. I couldn't move. It felt like my entire body was paralyzed with fear. The little voice in my head was asking only one question, if Lisa is over there, then who is in my living room? I didn't stop to check. I immediately ran to the house next door and asked my neighbors to call the police. Two officers arrived and searched my house from top to bottom, but they didn't fina a living soul. How could they? The only person in my house was a dead woman. The next morning, I left the house and I didn't come back. Now I live in a city where there are more live people and less dead. I heard that my former neighbors, Michael and Lisa, moved out soon after I left. I asked around and one of my friends said that the reason they moved was because the mother and father of the family had gone insane. They're such fools, my friend laughed. They thought that their house was haunted. I tried to laugh along with him, but I couldn't even muster a smile. The Family Gathering is a scary ghost story about a girl who hates birthdays. Especially her 14th birthday. I have always hated family gatherings. I hate my birthday most of all. Year in, year out, it's always the same. Everybody goes through the motions. Everyone plays their part. My mom bustles about the kitchen, preparing finger food and greeting the guests with a fake smile plastered across her face. My dad always drinks way too much and staggers around, laughing too loud and slapping people on the back too hard. My grandmother smothers me with kisses and I shudder with disgust as I feel her hairy chin brush against my cheek. My uncle bombards me with questions, asking if I have a boyfriend yet and if not, why not? My aunt tells me all about her daughter and how well perfect she is and how she is doing at school. She always takes pains to mention me how smart she is and how she is so much smarter than me. My little cousins race around the house like cockroaches, stomping on the floor, jumping on the stairs, squealing and hollering at the top of their lungs. They climb over furniture and crawl under tables, pulling and tugging at everything in sight. Nothing goes untouched by their grubby little hands. Around and around they go, like rats on a wheel. I honestly can't believe I'm related to these people, but I have to hold my tongue. I don't want them to resent me more than they already do. 
The table is lined with soggy sandwiches and stale chips. Bottles of wine are followed by bottles of whiskey and vodka. They all sit around the living room, gulping down their drinks, swapping stories about the good old times and boasting about themselves. I cringe as I listen to them laughing and cackling like a bunch of hyenas. It's enough to drive anyone insane. I get up and leave the room, desperate to clear my head. I know that, in his jacket pocket, my uncle has a packet of cigarettes and a lighter. Surely he won't miss one, I think. I can hear all the adults in the living room singing a song, so I go to the kitchen to sneak a quick smoke. Surely nobody will notice. There's a strange smell in the air that makes me wrinkle up my nose, but I don't pay much attention to it. My little cousins are already in the kitchen, up to mischief, as usual. They give me a startled look when I come in, as if they've done something naughty and they're afraid I will catch them. I put the cigarette between my lips and head over towards the window. I flick the cigarette lighter and suddenly a jet of flame shoots across the room to the old gas stove. There's a deafening explosion and the room erupts in flames. The whole house is on fire. I hear the screams and cries. I smell the burning flesh. I feel the intense heat as we are all consumed in the inferno and I close my eyes and sigh with relief as it all dissolves into silence. Until next year. When I will be 14 again. Over and over again. Forever 14. The first day of school is a scary story about a student who moves to a new town and starts attending a new school, but has trouble finding the right classroom. The first day of school is always nerve-wracking for any student. My first day at a new school was an absolute nightmare. I was 14 years old and my family had just moved to a new town. Moved home. My dad had been offered a job with better pay and a mere week later, we had sold our house and rented an apartment in the town we moved to. It was during the summer we moved, so it was simple starting at my new school. On the first day, I walked alone to the school. I was nervous about having to make new friends. When I arrived, I picked up a timetable and saw that my first class was mathematics. It was in room 104. I began walking down the hallways, searching for the room, but the school was like a maze. Eventually, the bell rang and the students made their way to their classrooms. In less than a minute, the corridors were deserted. I stopped in front of a pair of old-looking wooden double doors. I pushed and with a scraping sound of metal on wood, they opened. I found myself in a corridor that was old and dusty. The lockers were all hanging open and the stench of mold and damp hung in the air. I was about to turn around and go back the way I came, when I noticed the numbers on the classroom doors. 100. 101. 102. I began walking down the hallway, but when I peered through the windows of each classroom, they were empty. Then, I came to room 104. I peeked through the window. All of the students were sitting at their desks, the teacher was standing at the blackboard and class was in session. I quietly opened the door and went inside. None of the other students paid any attention to me. I started to apologize awkwardly for being late, but the teacher just turned her back on me and began writing on the board. Turning red from embarrassment, I hurriedly found a free seat at the front of the classroom and sat down. The teacher had already written her name in chalk on the blackboard. It was Mrs. Taylor. I was nervous and self-conscious, so I didn't want to draw attention to myself. Throughout the class, I just kept my head down and concentrated on solving the math's problems. Eventually, after what seemed like hours, the bell rang and the class ended. The other students scrambled out of their desks and ran out the door. I looked at my watch and was shocked to see that it was already 3 p.m. The school day was over and I had only attended one class. I walked down the corridors, trying to find the exit. All of a sudden, I heard someone calling my name and looked around. There was a teacher making his way towards me, and he had a frown on his face. You. Yes, you. You've the new boy, aren't you, he said. Uh. Yes, I replied. Where have you been, he demanded. I've been searching for you all day. 
Why didn't you go to your classes? But I was in class, I protested. Which class, he demanded. Mrs. Taylor's class, I replied. Room 104. The teacher's eyes grew wide and he flew into a rage. I suppose you think you're pretty funny, don't you, he shouted. Well, you're not. It's no laughing matter. Now get out of my sight. I was very confused and, on the long walk home, I kept wondering what I had said that got him so upset. As soon as I reached my house, I turned on my laptop and went online. I started searching for the name of the school and the teacher, Mrs. Taylor. What I found scared me to my very soul. There were old news articles about a terrible massacre that happened in the school ten years before. One morning, bright and early, a crazed gunman had simply walked into the school and started shooting. He stood at the doorway of a classroom and shot the teacher. Then he picked off the students one by one until every single person in the class was lying dead in a pool of blood. There were pictures of the classroom where the murders happened. I recognized it immediately. It was room 104. There were also photos of the victims. I recognized them too. Trembling with fear, I gazed at the smiling faces of Mrs. Taylor and all of the students I had been in class with. I felt sick to my stomach. My hands were shaking and a chill ran through me. I spent all night trying to convince myself that it wasn't true. The next morning, I was too terrified to go back to school. I broke down and told my parents what had happened. At first, they thought it was just nerves, but eventually, after I had refused to go to school for a whole week, they gave in and enrolled me in a different school. I managed to get on with my life and tried my best to forget all about the incident. I almost succeeded. This morning, I received a letter in the mail. There was no stamp on the envelope and no return address. It had been hand-delivered. When I opened it and read the printed card inside, my hands started shaking again. It was an invitation to a class reunion, and it was signed from Mrs. Taylor. The Pet Cat is a scary story about a girl who moves to a new village and finds out she has a crazy old woman as a neighbor. A few months ago, my parents moved to a small village and I had to attend a new school. The house next door to ours was owned by a crazy old woman. She spent her days sitting all alone on a bench in front of the house and muttering to herself under her breath. One day, when I was walking by, I noticed that she seemed to be petting something that was sitting in her lap. At first, I thought it was a cat, but when I took a closer look, I realized there was nothing there. She was just holding her hand above her knees and stroking thin air. Perhaps she had a pet cat or a dog once, I thought, and it died and in her disordered mind, she thinks it's still there. I felt sorry for the old woman and with a sigh, I continued on my way. Then, one night, when I was sleeping soundly in my bed, something strange happened. I woke up to feel something hairy lying by my side. It gave me a fright and I jumped off the bed. Just then, I noticed a shadow moving out of the corner of my eye. It went across the floor and out the door. I was startled, but when I calmed down, I realized it was probably just some stray cat or dog that had wandered into the house. That was when I happened to glance out my bedroom dow and saw the crazy old woman next door. She was standing on the sidewalk, under the street light. Her long, gray hair was hanging loose and fluttering in the wind. Her eyes were wide and she was looking directly at me. I was so scared that I jumped back from the window. Then, the woman turned and went back inside her house. It took me a long time to calm down, but eventually, I went back to bed. As I was drifting off to sleep, I remembered something that struck me as odd. When I saw the shadow of the stray cat or dog running out of my room, it didn't really seem as if it was running, it seemed more like it was rolling across the floor to the door. The next morning, when I woke up, I got dressed and went downstairs to eat breakfast. On my way to school that morning, I passed by the old woman's house again. As usual, she was sitting there on the bench, muttering to herself and stroking something invisible in her lap. When I passed by, I distinctly heard her say, what were you doing? Why did you run away from me last night? Look how you scared that girl. 
I got a queasy feeling in the pit of my stomach and it made me shiver. It was all I could do not to start running. At school, I decided to ask my friends about the old woman. No one really knew anything, except that she had been released from a mental hospital about 10 years ago. They said she had a history of mental problems and that was why everyone kept away from her. Since her release, all she did was sit all day on the bench outside her home. A few days later, MHY father struck up a conversation with an old man who had lived in the village all his life. When my father asked him about the old woman, he had a very chilling story to tell. He said that the old woman had spent over 30 years of her life in a mental institution. When she was young, she had been married and she and her husband had lived together in the same house. According to him, she suspected for years that her husband was cheating on her, but he always denied it. Then, one night, she caught him with another woman. She hacked him to death with an axe and cut off his head. When the police came, she was sitting on the bench in front of her house with an insane grin on her face. The severed head of her husband was in her lap and she was talking to it and stroking it gently. The Poplar Tree is a creepy ghost story about two young girls in an English boarding school who are bullied and excluded by their classmates. I remember Crampton Park School. I went there when I was 12 years old. It was a boarding school. There were about 100 girls and we all slept in one big dormitory. The house was very large and dark looking. It may have been beautiful once, but it had fallen into disrepair. Quite frankly, the place was crumbling and falling apart. The grounds were very large and full of trees. There was a very high wall round the garden. It felt like a prison. We were trapped in there for so long, it began to seem like our whole world. I don't think it was a very good school. The teachers weren't unkind to us or anything, but everything about it was miserable. Everything seemed to go wrong. It seemed like Donna and I were always in trouble. There were about a hundred other girls, but none of them liked us. That's how we were thrown together. We were the unpopular ones. Nobody wanted to hang around with us. I suppose that was why we hung around with each other. Nobody else wanted us. Donna was extremely ugly. She looked very odd, with her wild, frizzy, unkempt hair and her drab, unfashionable clothes. She had spots all over her face and wore thick glasses that made her eyes seem as if they were bugging out. I looked almost as bad. It was like we had some kind of disease. Nobody would come near us. They were ashamed to be seen with us. Sometimes, we were ashamed to be seen with each other. I don't think we realized how unhappy we were. We never spoke about it because we were too ashamed. We used to pretend everything was all right. We tried to tell ourselves it was just because we were different. We used to sit there together in a lonely part of the garden, under the shade of a beautiful old poplar tree. We called it the popular tree. We used to try and fool ourselves into believing that we were the popular ones and all the other girls were the freaks. It was obvious we were deluding ourselves but, because there were two of us, we were able to keep up the delusion and that just made it worse. It was impossible to believe anyone could ever care about either of us. We didn't even care about each other. We were just like two patients in a hospital, shut away from the others in quarantine because of a disgusting and contagious disease. I began to feel that, if this was what life was like, then I couldn't bear to live it any longer. Then, one day, the teacher gave us a class project and I was paired with another girl. She was one of the most popular girls in school. She was so pretty and everybody liked her. While we were working on the project together, she somehow took pity on me and we became friends. She took me under her wing and showed me how to improve my appearance. She got me to brush my hair and wash my face properly and use deodorant. She told me she didn't mind me, but she couldn't stand Donna. When we finished the project, I thought she would drop me, but she didn't. We went on bring friends. Then, she introduced me to her friends and, to my surprise, the others began to like me as well. I joined their group and set about distancing myself from Donna. She was left alone. I deserted her and would avoid her like the plague. 
From the moment we parted ways, everything began to go right for me. She seemed to represent everything that was horrible in my life. She represented a period of my life I wanted to forget. Donna was miserable when I left her. She never cried, she just used to wander around by herself, looking lost and forlorn. When I was with the others, I used to see her, sitting there alone under the poplar tree, watching me. Whenever the others pointed and made fun of her, I joined in, laughing and jeering along with them. One afternoon, Donna approached me when there was no one else around. She asked me to come with her to the poplar tree. I didn't want to go with her, but I felt guilty, so I went. When we got there, I couldn't bear it. I didn't want the others to see me with her. I was afraid the stench of her unpopularity would rub off on me. I was so frightened of being excluded again that I said terrible things to her. I told her hated her. I told her I wished she was dead. That night, as I lay awake in bed, I saw her get up. She put on her dressing gown and went out of the dormitory. She didn't come back. I lay there waiting and waiting, with a terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach. It felt like a tightness in my throat. The next morning, the teachers noticed Donna was missing. They searched all over for her, but nobody could find her. They called her parents, but they hadn't heard from her either. Everybody assumed she had run away. A few weeks later, I was out in the gardens. I went over to the poplar tree and sat down in the shade. Then, I happened to look up. That's when I saw her. Two rotting feet were dangling just above my head. Her dead eyes stared down at me accusingly. She had hanged herself. All along, her rotting corpse had been dangling there for weeks, hidden among the branches of the poplar tree, and nobody knew. I had a nervous breakdown after that. I collapsed and they brought me to the hospital. I lay in bed for weeks, wasting away, unable to sleep, unable to eat. They didn't know if I would live or die. Life was never the same after that. The school tried to hush it up, but soon word leaked out. It was all over the newspapers. Little girl commits suicide in school, the headlines screamed. It was a scandal. The newspapers contained few details and a lot of speculation. The tree was cut down. Some of the teachers and staff resigned. Most of the students were taken home by their parents. The school was eventually forced to close down and the crumbling old house and grounds were sold at a loss. Ever since then, I have been haunted by Donna. I see her in every tree I pass in the street. She hangs there from the branches, her face all red and her purple tongue dangling from her mouth, staring at me accusingly with those wretched bugged out eyes. It doesn't matter where I am or who I'm with. I wake up in the middle of the night and see her standing over me, with the belt of her dressing gown tied around her neck. She beckons me to come with her and I am powerless to resist. Some nights, I find myself walking in my sleep. My husband discovers me with a belt wrapped tightly around my neck. He has to shake me awake and slap me to make me calm down. It's only a matter of time before she succeeds. It's only a matter of time before she exacts her revenge. It's only a matter of time before Donna manages to take me with her, back to the poplar tree. Handprints is a scary story about a young couple who are out on a date. One day, a couple went out on a date. They wanted a little bit of privacy, so they drove to a mountain known to be a good spot for young couples. A few hours later, the sun started to go down and they started to head home. Somehow they made a wrong turn and found themselves on a road they weren't familiar with. It was already late, though, so they continued down the narrow road until they found themselves in front of a tunnel. They definitely hadn't passed through it on their way in and it was definitely creepy, but it was the only way they could go. They slowly drove into the tunnel. Bang! As soon as the darkness enveloped the car, something hit the rear window. Startled, the woman turned around to see what it was, but she didn't see anything. There weren't even any other cars behind them. As far as she could tell, they were completely alone in the tunnel. Bang! Bang! Her boyfriend began to speed up in an attempt to get out of the tunnel faster. 
bang 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 it sounded as if dozens of things were striking the car from all directions the man pressed his foot harder on the gas pedal they both wanted to get somewhere with people as soon as possible the tunnel ended after what seemed like an eternity, and shortly thereafter they found their way to a small gas station on the side of the road. The two got out of the car and felt relief as they stood under the bright lights. Just as they were getting ready to get back in the car, the woman noticed that there were handprints all over the windows. They were in all sizes, and there was barely an inch of space on the glass that wasn't covered in handprints. Shaken, they asked the gas station worker to clean the windows for them. The two sat back down in the car and watched as the man quickly got to work on cleaning the windows. As he wiped and scrubbed, the two in the car felt a cold fear creep up their spines. He continued scrubbing all the same, but when he finished all of the windows, he cocked his head to the side and walked up to the driver's side window and knocked lightly. I'm sorry, he said, but all of these handprints are on the inside.